Hello and welcome to the Hunter Bond podcast, um, where I get the opportunity to speak to the key players and leaders within the world of finance, technology and recruitment. Um, today, I'm very pleased to be joined by Dan Reichman. Um, so Dan has a wealth of experience in designing and building various fintech systems and trading platforms, and is a specialist in blockchain and crypto economics. Um, so Dan is currently the CTO of Tidal Finance. Um, so Tidal Finance is a project established to decentralize the insurance marketplace, connecting insurance sellers and their buyers. Um, the decentralized finance space is becoming more and more mainstream, uh, and Tidal is here to really revolutionize how purchase insurance is done. Um, so firstly, Dan, thank you for joining us, and, and how are you doing? Hi, Matt. I'm great. Thank you very much for having me. That's all right. No, thank you for coming on, on, you know, on today. You know, I think, especially around the subject of blockchain and, and cryptocurrency, which is such a hot topic at the moment, um, I, I'd love to get your, your input on your, your journey, your specialism and, and, and knowledge around the subject and where you think blockchain and crypto is going. Um, but I, I'd also you know, love to touch on you know, your experience. Um, so, so for anyone who doesn't know Dan, Dan has a, a wealth of both technical and leadership experience within the world of finance, cryptocurrency and blockchain. Um, so I'd love to get the insight of working in, I guess, both the bigger sort of larger financial institutions and now moving into more of the sort of fintech startup space. Um, but firstly, with regards to Tidal Finance, um, for anyone who doesn't know Tidal Finance, could you tell us a little bit about what Tidal sure. Finance is and what you guys are doing there? Sure. Yeah. So uh, again, great to be here. Um, in terms of Tidal, uh, there is this whole movement that started a couple of years ago, decentralized finance, DeFi, where a lot of different projects offering essentially some sliver of financial services on the blockchain and crypto world. Um, this type of service is started from simply, let's say, borrowing Bitcoins or ability to borrow money against crypto, right? Wow. And Right now, there are literally thousands of these projects. Every week, we read about new projects in the area. And a lot of these projects have new code, new software. And almost as often, we hear about hacks where these DeFi projects have been hacked. Um, Tidal and a couple of other companies are trying to create a, an insurance-like product where people can stake the capital in one of these decentralized finance uh, projects, protocols, and uh, they can buy coverage where if one of these projects is hacked, you will get some kind of payout to wow, compensate okay. you for the losses. Okay. So you're, you're, you're yeah, basically providing more assurances to these new protocols. And actually, I guess, because sure. that is a worry is, you know, someone like myself who, who would be more of a, more of a, uh, you know, a light investor in something like cryptocurrency is that, sure. you know, your money is going into this, you know, electronic system rather than the physical cash of itself. And is there the securities sure. behind it, especially with all these different protocols? So, so how, do, how does that actually work then? Yeah. So it's, it's actually an interesting question, because if you think about traditional insurance, right, let's say life insurance, there is a wealth of information. There are centuries of history of uh, how long people live, whether you smoke, whether you yeah. drink, right, how fast you drive, things like that. Whereas with, with software and specifically with DeFi, where each new protocol has effectively new code, it's very difficult to, uh, yeah. to have any kind of historical perspective and understand uh, how to um, look at the risk and how to quantify that risk, right? So there are a couple of other projects that have more, I would say, a traditional insurance approach where they just say, okay, we, we have our own calculation or our own estimate of what the risks are. And, you know, here's uh, by the insurance. Uh, what Tidal did, which is unique, we have this category of guarantor and we're given the ability to new projects to act as a guarantor. So effectively, if I were having a new project XYZ and I wanna kind of guarantee that project, I can stake my own capital, probably the tokens that I've uh, raised or capital I've raised in my own um, ICO or ITO, right? Token issuance process. And then if there is a hack, essentially my capital becomes the first level of defense, right? My right. own capital uh, becomes the first pool of money that will be used to, to pay out for, um, you know, for people that bought the coverage, right? Um, it, it creates the process where protocols, the new protocols, A, they have ability to attract new investors because there is, uh, there is a security or some level of security, yeah. right? On the other level, 
these new protocols, they incentivize to do a better job of uh, making yeah. sure that their, <laughs> their software is tested. Yeah, now, and, it's, now it's their money that's on the line. They're, they're going to be more willing to, right. to, to, to worry about things like cybersecurity and whatnot. Are, are, are a lot of these new projects and protocols looking into this kind of thing? Or is it too much of is it a risk for them to, to kind of invest in this stuff? Or Well, it's a risk for them to, to start a startup, right? right. And <laughs> venture into this new world. Yeah. But if they're doing this already and they're trying to attract new investors or people to participate in the protocols, it behooves for them to, yeah. to look for something like Tidal to offer that product. The interesting thing is there are, there are companies or other projects like Cover, for instance, or Nexus Mutual, and they're leaning towards ensuring more established DeFi protocols. And in the DeFi world, established maybe six months old or a year right. old, right? Yeah. But there are, but there, there. It's very difficult to ensure truly new protocol, and that's where Tidal comes in. And we, I can't really speak about specifics, but there are a number of new projects that we're partnering up with, and we're offering coverage for these new projects. And I guess that's actually going to be setting the standard then. So now, if it's if it's a common place that that there, you know. The, these new projects or, or protocols are offering this kind of insurance if you don't do that then you know at that point i guess is this you know i, I think consumers and whatnot will be less likely to to invest or or, or go through that sort of thing so what what so why, why was you'd say that's probably why it was built to improve the standards of the of the marketplace or or just give more insurances Right. I mean, look, the kind of initial problem that we were looking to solve is just to provide insurance to DeFi protocols, right? Uh, but as we were digging into this whole problem and coming up with a solution, then we evolved a little bit and came up with this guarantor concept. Effectively, the way our system works, it's, it's, it's akin to mutual insurance, right? So you, if you have capital, you can stake your capital to provide coverage, and then somebody can buy that coverage, right? right? But because we have the guarantor pool, and as I said, guarantor is first line of defense, we're giving the liquidity providers or coverage providers some assurance that there is, they kind of in, in the second position, right? To, to pay out for the hacks. So it's- Two layers I think of coverage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a good design. It helps people to, um, um, it, it attracts the liquidity providers to our platform. It also attracts the buyers, but also it attracts the new projects. So it's win, 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 I think. Yeah. And are you getting a lot of buy-in from the marketplace with this? Is it very new? Are people needing to kind of come yeah, around, it's very to new. The, around to it? We, we're not live yet. We, we're on okay. testnet. We should be live in the next few weeks. But as I said, we already have a number of uh, projects lined up that they will be buying coverage for their own protocols uh, from the day one. No, it is worth saying. I mean, Tidal Finance, how, how long has it been going? About a year, year or two? Or? About a year. Yeah, a year and yeah. a half. Just yeah. already early, early stages. How, how has that journey gone? I mean, did you was you there at the, the foundations at the bottom of that from the very beginning? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, me, uh, uh, Chad Lou is the CEO of the company and a few other uh, folks kind of got together and started talking about the problem and how we can solve the problem and kind of, and it's evolved, right? We came up mm -hmm. with the model, we came up with the uh, economics for the token and uh, kind of, uh, we hired the team, we have developers in Russia and China and we, that's, you know, that's the process. And I worked with these developers to actually build the product. Yeah, brilliant. I mean, that's that's what I've spoken to a few um, you know, fintech uh, co-founders or CTOs, and it is always around how can we solve a problem and what sure. solution can we provide? But within finance technology, there's always the the regulations and the governance that you kind of need to get around fairly quickly before and need to work out, well, is this product even viable before we put it into process? Sure. Was was there much of a, how, how much kind of had to go into regulations and governance? Was it a lot with what you're doing or was it fairly accepted? I think it's fairly accepted simply because what we're doing, it's not a financial product, right? If wow. we were issuing, like, for instance, there are companies like um, Synthetics, where they're issuing synthetic tokens that represent real assets. So you can buy, for instance, a token that represents shares in Tesla or Apple, right? So that would, those would be considered securities. And then you have to think about uh, where your company is located. Uh, who are the investors that you will be able to sell your product to, things like that. If you look at BitMEX, for instance, right, uh, with the perpetual swap, 
U.S. regulators do not recognize perpetual swap as a, as a legitimate financial product. Right. Therefore, if there is any U.S. investor that would participate um, in that ecosystem and, and essentially trade on BitMEX, and that's what happened. U.S. regulators went after them and, you know, Arthur Hayes and other founders found themselves in hot water. Yeah, and you're seeing that more and more as well, you know, different cryptocurrencies sure. getting banned in, in different countries. I'd love to touch on, um, I guess, your, your journey as well into crypto and, and blockchain in, in general. And, sure. and I guess, you know, how it came around and how it's such a hot topic and, and where you kind of see it's going. So uh, right. it, just a little bit more about your journey then. How did you how sure. did you get into this field? So, I mean, if, if you let me kind of start from the very beginning, in a sense, I mean, I'm original from Soviet Union, so I'm very much aware how government can overreach and uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So the, the, the concept, the idea of um, kind of mathematical formula that will uh, control and um, kind of a value, right? Mm. Was appealing to me on the, on the philosophical level. To, but to be honest, when I heard about crypto initially, probably in 2012, 2013, I kind of stumbled on the word currency because it didn't look like a currency to me. It didn't have like traditional institution around currency ecosystem, yeah. right? There was no overnight money market uh, rate. There was just none of that existed, right? So I stumbled on that. But on the other side, uh, I saw pretty quickly that it effectively trades very similar to foreign exchange, the so FX market, right? And we saw opportunities for arbitrage, and that's how we started. We, we built a system that connected to multiple exchanges, and we were buying on exchange A and so on exchange B. Yeah. And back in like 2016, 2017, there were all, up to 5% discrepancies between the prices on these exchanges. You, really? you were, yeah, you, you, you could even do arbitrage manually, just buy here, turn around and sell there, <laughs> right? So and that's how we kind of started. And the, my, my next revelation was that, to me, it looked more like a CFD or a container, meaning that what, what is cryptocurrency? It's a digital certificate, right? So if you look at the Bitcoin, what does it represent? It doesn't represent anything uh, outside than just the digital certificate that is uh, immutable, hard to duplicate, right? Hard to yeah. replicate, has a limited number that will be issued 21 million. So it has a kind of inherited value on that level, but you can create a token and say that token represents one ounce of gold, right? Or that yeah. token represents a piece of real estate and it becomes a digital certificate and it can travel, it can trade all over the world. I mean. A lot of the rules that we live by in the financial world are very arbitrary. Why does the exchange trade between 9.30 and 4 p.m.? And then, boom, it doesn't trade anymore, right? Or it doesn't trade on weekends. I mean, I understand people want to go home, but in terms of financial product, I mean, something happens, let's say, at 3 p.m. on Sunday, yeah, and you have no way of reacting to that, right? So... To me, crypto was kind of interesting, but my, my thought process evolved. And, um, and I, I, I mentioned this when you and I spoke before the podcast that I look at internet where internet liberated the information. And I think what crypto is doing, crypto is liberating capital. We have developers in Eastern Europe. We have developers in other countries. And I talked to a few of them about it. What they would pay them in crypto and they only convert what they need to leave on to local currency. So people in countries like Venezuela or Iran or Russia for that matter, they didn't have an opportunity to kind of extract themselves from local economy anymore uh, before, right? I mean, maybe those countries don't have kind of true democratic voting, but people vote with $100 bill every day, right? You decide where you want to spend it. You decide where you want to invest it. Even if you have $1, you still do that every day. So mm. crypto gives people in a lot of different places, essentially ability to remove themselves to some level from whatever the local tyranny they have to deal with. And consequentially, if you look at Venezuela or Iran or places like Nigeria, Bitcoin, what you see trades there at 20, 30% premium. So there is a tremendous utility there. Mm. And if you look at it, like, so, so uh, cell phones were invented in the United States, right? But then in the 90s, they proliferated a lot faster in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe. And it's because in the US, 
you move and you call the phone company and next day you have the landline in your apartment. It was that simple, right? Mm. But again, Russia or Poland, I mean, you, you move somewhere and good luck getting a phone line. Yeah. So, so it was speeds up progress in these, these things. Right. Yeah. And that's why in the U S for instance, or Western Europe, look, yeah, we, we can complain about banking system and how long it takes to transfer money, but in general it works. But if again, you're in Africa, you are some other places, there is no local banking system that works well. That's why people go into crypto. To the, to the, to the banking right. systems. And, yeah. and that's why they're willing to pay the premium. Right? And it's, I think a great point, as you say, you know, especially if it's, you look at somewhere like uh, Venezuela where the currency you know, plummeted and whatnot, I think, I think a lot of people's worries in terms of investing or having their money locked away in cryptocurrency is the, I guess, the unpredictable nature of its values um, flying up and down. Um, but you can have that in normal economics and in, in, in normal currencies. But do you, do, you, do, you, do you see at the moment with the validity of cryptocurrency, it being a safe place to store your money or invest your money? So look, uh, I'm a terrible trader. So if I tell you to buy something, you know <laughs> okay, better off selling I won't it. reach out to you for any, any of us in spending currencies. Then, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, personally, I, I have a small percentage of my, my assets in crypto yeah, two, three, four percent, and uh, it's not something that I need to cash out today or tomorrow. So I really don't care what Bitcoin yeah. is today. I mean, I'm kind of watching the prices more for <laughs> entertainment purposes, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I see again five, ten years from now, it's just it's gonna go higher. I mean, it's it's a limited supply, right? Mm. And you talk if you talk about the like, 20, 30 percent movement in Bitcoin, let's say. Okay, as alternative in Venezuela, you have, you know, 20% devaluation every single day, right? So that's pretty predictable. Would you prefer that, you know? So it's, yeah, it's, it's volatile. And Bitcoin may have been envisioned as a micropayment system, but, you know, it evolved into um, kind of store of value situation, right? So akin to gold. I mean, you're not going to carry a brick of gold to, to buy a cup of coffee. So I don't think Bitcoin would ever be something that, uh, you know, good for that. But also, look, U.S. government and probably in U.K. and in Western Europe, U.S. government printed 30% of all the dollars printed ever were printed last year. Right. So it just I mean, there is no discipline. Governments are getting, yeah. you know, they, they so in, is inflation coming this year or next year? I have no idea, but I think it's coming for sure. And to have a small piece or a small part of my capital stocked away in crypto, I think that's a good idea. And and with Bitcoin, I mean, uh, uh, part of my, my ignorance on the subject, but once it reaches the full mined capacity, there's no ability to then mine more at any point. That's, that's that done, is it? Not like the banks. Right. I mean, look. Right. So Bitcoin, right, it's it, it, it's it's software code and all the miners, they accept the code and it's it's going to be very difficult to change that. There'll be 15 other forks. Essentially, people will take Bitcoin and say, well, here's a Bitcoin uh, NEO and that Bitcoin now will have no upper limit as an example, right? Or there'll be some other tweaks. I mean, there are, there's Bitcoin Cash, there's Bitcoin Cash SV, so there's Bitcoin Gold. So they're all other kind of copycats of the Bitcoin that essentially use the same code with small tweaks, and right. it will continue. But the Bitcoin, the, the what we see now, it will not change. Miners and everybody who is invested in it, they have vested interest not to increase the supply. Right. But that's not to say it couldn't, though. Or is it is there one is there one like I guess main source that decides that or is it a whole no it's a, yeah it's basically whole the whole community. community all the miners have to vote on this and decide right, okay. what they want to do and chances of them agreeing to something like that is just I mean theoretically it's possible yes but, but it doesn't not, benefit anyone to happen. do that yeah, yeah. okay yeah, yeah, yeah. so do you, uh, I know you touched on the, the subject of oh you wouldn't necessarily see Bitcoin being used to buy a coffee as such could you do, you do you not see it being moved into a day-to-day sort of currency then is it going to be for larger transactions most of the time do you think I think it will be for larger transactions I think it will be for um again just kind of uh you know keeping reserves for instance yeah. um i think we'll instead see of burying your gold in the garden as you say you, right. 
Yeah. I mean, we're already seeing some corporations putting Bitcoin on the balance sheet, right? And it's just a matter of time where countries will start doing the same. Yeah. Right? So uh, I, to me, it's, again, it's more akin to gold, digital gold, if you will. You, you hear the stories of people, oh, I had a, a you know, I had a hard drive of, you know, 100,000 Bitcoin and lost it and whatnot. How, how, do, how does, is, is it now more cloud available or is it still as simple as, you know, it's on my computer, if that computer dies and I lose it sort of thing? Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely could happen. There are projects that are kind of creating the, the system where you can register all your wallets. And then right. if, let's say, you I die... most people or... use wallets these days, don't they? Some sort right. of cloud-based wallet of some kind. Well, cloud-based or some, right, some kind of cold storage wallets. So uh, there are projects that if, if you're... If, let's say, your all your wallets become inactive for a period of time, then some kind of event is triggered, let's say six months later, and all the tokens, are, all the coins are transferred to a wallet or can be distributed to your heirs, as an example, right? Mm. But ultimately, if, yeah, you need to take care of your, mm. of your wallets, if you have your, your kids or your wife or your spouse, you need to yeah. you know, share your keys. There's a story a couple of days ago, this guy uh, drowned in Costa Rica who had over a billion dollars in Bitcoins. Oh, yes. And I, I did see that. Yeah, and apparently he did not share his keys with any of his relatives or anybody else. I don't know that to be the fact, but that's what I read. Sounds, sounds suspicious. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. yeah, it could be you know, buried at sea or, or, or in a, as you say, you know, I was talking about you know, burying gold in the garden. If you forget where you uh, or where you plant your gold or, 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 or bury your gold, then um, yeah, it's, it's going to be lost, I guess. But uh, no, that's, um, so, you know, with, with, I guess, the explosion of the subject of crypto, do you think that was round the usage of crypto and how it's liberating capital? Or do you think it's just the people have been buying more into the, oh, it's an investment and it spikes and I can earn lots of money from it? Do you think that's probably the main reason? Or do you think people are actually really buying into the potential usage of, of crypto over normal currency? Yeah, I, I think it's basically the the explosion was based on the get rich quick scheme, right? There was yeah. a lot of stories, a lot of people. <laughs> I mean, yeah, look, I mean, look at what happened in this, uh, around 20, uh, 2000, 1999, right? With the dot com boom, it was a very similar story. The the dot com companies that were started around that time, ninety nine percent of them just poof, die, disappeared over the next few years, right? But out of that dust came out, Amazon came out, Facebook, Google. So mm. same thing here. I mean, uh, a lot of the people that invested in 2015 or 2014, <coughs> some of them made a lot of money, some of them sold too early, right? And some of them invested in coins that, again, turned to garbage. But uh, yeah. the, the be utility... Losers, I, for there to be winners, yeah. isn't there, of something yeah. like this, where it's a gamble. Um, but, but again, we are in 2021. So let's just say it's about 25 years worth of um, internet evolution, kind of, right? I mean, internet was around before that, but I think around 95, it kind of started to become a mainstream. So that's how long it took for internet to become a, a, a necessity for everyone, right? Yeah. If, again, in, 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 in 2000, uh, you add dot com to the name of your company and the valuations just double or triple, mm -hmm. right? But today, every company is an internet company, whether they want it or not, and whether they talk about it or not, right? I mean, so, same yeah. thing, I think, with crypto. Right now, you can say, like, I, I don't know if you remember from a couple of years ago, there was this iced tea company out on Long Island here in New York, and they added blockchain to their name and the stock, I think, quadruple or something like that, right? So, uh, I, 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 but I think, yeah, but I think in a few years, uh, maybe in a decade, I don't know when, but at some point soon, people will uh, will see blockchain more mainstream. But at the same time, I got to say, um, blockchain in its own design is inefficient because mm -hmm. it's designed to create a process for um, consensus forming between the parties that not necessarily want to cooperate, right? Right. Um, so if you just want to have a quick database, you can buy a license from Oracle or from Microsoft and you can, you know, store whatever data you need to store pretty quickly. Mm. So I'm not a big fan of uh, kind of corporate 
blockchain because if the corporation sets up five different servers and those are the nodes and they have five versions of their own database, you can have one version and you can achieve exactly the same thing. Right. So there's, there's a bit of a marketing uh, aspect of it. But from the public blockchain, again, from the ability to you and I do business without trusting each other and ability to um, verify transactions and confirm transactions, essentially, automatically, I think it's very powerful and it will only be used more and more. Yeah, I t- definitely touched on blockchain for anyone who doesn't understand blockchain a lot. How is it kind of being used at the moment? So I don't know if you want me to get into a bit of a neat degree of what blockchain is. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not a technical expert on the, on the subject of blockchain. It's never been my kind of specialism, but for anyone watching, I'm sure they'll take some insight from it. So, I mean, uh, the way there are a couple of inventions that were kind of, uh, made before that allowed for blockchain or for Bitcoin to work. And one of them is this hashing technology where effectively you can take any string, run it through an algorithm, and it gives you, let's say, 64 character uh, string. And that string represents whatever the information you have. So you can take, let's say, I don't know, war and peace, right? Feed it into a computer and the 64 character string comes out, right? And then you can change one period in that novel and run it through the same process and the string is gonna be different, oh, Okay. right? So. So the way uh, blockchain works, you have a block of let's say two megabyte of data and we can write all the information about different transactions, Bitcoin movement between wallet A and wallet B. And then you generate that hash of that two megabyte of data and you put that hash into the second block of data. And then you can add all whatever transactions you you need to add to the second block of data and you hash that and put that hash into the third block of data. So now, if you change any one character in any previous blocks, the hash that you're gonna generate will not match what you already have right, okay. in your last block. Okay, okay. So, so, so it's a way that, or allowing someone to know that the data you're receiving is the correct data and hasn't been any interruptions in the middle or, or whatnot, or it hasn't been messed around with in a way by layering it. Right. Right. So you cannot go back to, let's say, uh, a blog that was mined in September 1st of 2019, let's say, right? And just instead of saying uh, one Bitcoin was sent from address A to address B, there was 100 Bitcoins. When you do that, the hash from that block is not going to match the right. hash that it's in the next block and the block, right? And it just, and that's why it's called block chain, right? This, this blocks a chain through this hashing mechanism. Right. So it's a, <laughs> yeah, it's a kind of a simple design, but brilliant. And uh, everything that comes with it, it allows for this whole process to work. Right. It, it, that's what allows for, because normally, I don't know if you know this, but when you, when you, let's say you send me a file, right. When you send me a file, a copy of that file stays on your computer. Even when you delete that file from your computer, what you effectively do, you're deleting the index da- that file from the index table, but the actual file data is still on your hard drive. Oh, okay. Right? So another invention, because of this blockchain technology, when I send you Bitcoin, that Bitcoin doesn't stay on my computer, right. in my wallet, right? So this idea of ability to move this data and remove it from the previous location, right. Yeah, it's yeah. vital, for, yeah, obviously, for, for yeah, something like Bitcoin. Absolutely. So, yeah, so that and the ability to prevent double standing. So, yeah, it's 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 a brilliant invention. And there's there are all these different permutations and uh, there, are, there are new ideas. There is a new, uh, well, relatively new currency called Solana that a lot faster. It's kind of based on telecommunication uh, stamping of the, the data packets. So instead of doing maybe 10 transactions a second, it does about 400,000 transactions a second. So, I mean, the, the evolution of crypto is uh, still here with us and it's, uh, the, it's, the, it iterates very quickly and we're going to see a lot more interesting projects. In yeah, I was, I was definitely going to ask you, like, you know, where do you see, how, you know, what, what, where else can you see like blockchain actually making a big impact in different industries? So you mentioned telecommunications, but you think, you, you could you see any like corporations easily shifting in terms of just passing data 
around using blockchain more so or is it is it more complicated would it be only used for quite sophisticated things rather than look data? i think anywhere where data is touched by multiple parties blockchain is useful so as an example um property ownership records right um right now if you go to or well, at least in america you go to like a county office and you're looking for deeds for a property but the property could have been sold last time 100 years ago so mm-hmm. it's a piece of paper that was lost somewhere in the you know back room somewhere or it could be on a microfiche somewhere so the like i don't know if you remember like around 2008 when um uh, this mortgage trading fiasco yep. happened right with all so people were kind of uh, uh, people were uh, getting mortgages and the companies that were lending money were packaging these mortgages, selling them as a financial instrument and dicing and slicing it. And then at the end of the day, <laughs> nobody knew who actually owned that mortgage, right? And some people were not paying the mortgages, but the defense was find the person I owe money to. And if you can't find that person or that entity, I'm sorry, you know, I... Yeah. So, I'll just stay but, here in the meantime. but if you have a blockchain and all these transactions recorded on the blockchain and you have the companies that um, kind of provide mortgages, there are companies that um, uh, keep records of the property ownership, their insurance, all this, they're attaching the same information. Yeah. So instead of each of those companies having their own copies of the information, and that's a recipe where at some point there definitely will be discrepancies, right? But if you have a single uh, database, if you will, or single ledger, and that's, it's a public ledger anyway, I can go on, on in my county and ask for the property ownership information for yeah. a house next door, right? It's all public information anyway. So if we have it on the blockchain, and every time there's a transaction, everybody sees that transaction, it's recorded. And from now on, even 100 years from now, we can see the chain when the property was bought and then resold and resold and resold, right? So there'll be no discrepancies. Or with the financial transaction, same thing, right? I mean, um, in the, at least in the US, you traditionally you have all these different uh, players that participate in the, financial transaction in the in the life cycle of the transaction right there is a transfer agent um obviously there is a clearing house and sometimes it, what happens is that the the records get messed up and it, the company is supposed to have let's say a million shares but if you look at the transfer a, a agent book they may have a million too because some of the transfers they didn't record properly and things like that so Having uh, uh, corporate records on blockchain also makes sense. And I think you can just kind of medical records also. So yeah, any medical. situation, yeah. right? And it doesn't have to be transparent. It doesn't have to be visible from the outside. But I'm just saying any situation where there's data that has to be shared between different entities, something like this would be, I think, would be useful. Uh, and, you, and you think blockchain is, is really secure from still hackers or still people being able to ma- manipulate that data at all? Or is there any way around it? Bitcoin was never hacked. Different people were hacked. Exchanges mm-hmm. were hacked, right? But the Bitcoin itself, the blockchain itself, that keeps the record I'm sure there's of all been the Bitcoin transactions. Yeah, sure yeah. Tried. And yeah, why, why, sure. do you think, why do you think that is? Is it just the, the way that the system is designed or is it, like, is it actual securities on there or? It, the way it was designed, there are about 10,000 uh, computers that maintain blockchain, a Bitcoin ledger, right? right? Okay. Th- those are the miners. So for you to, uh, to hack Bitcoin itself, well, first of all, if you hack Bitcoin, then the value of Bitcoin will plummet. But out of those 10,000 computers, you essentially, you need to get 51% of hashing power yeah. to be able to change Bitcoin uh, blockchain. So either you have to get 10,001 computers and run those nodes, which would be an enormous investment. And if you do that, the value of the Bitcoin that you change, the, the blockchain you change for the Bitcoin, the value of Bitcoin will plummet. 
Yeah. So there is no economic value in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not that much effort put, putting all that effort into it <laughs> if it's just going to plummet it. Um, so when people stop mining, then when once it's been released and whatnot, did, did then still people w- wouldn't have would they have the ability then to kind of mess around with the different blockchains and different strings and things like that to change data and information, or is it literally just imperfect? Sure. So basically, the way it works, in addition to uh, mining rewards that miners get, right? Every time you do a transaction on the Bitcoin blockchain, you pay a transaction fee. And uh, you actually decide how much you want to pay. Excuse me. And then miners decide if you're paying them enough to include your transaction in the next block. Right. Okay. Right. As, as their number of participants, a number of transactions increases, uh, effectively, the the percentage of the rewards that miners get from the transaction fee is increasing as well. So in theory, um, the the last Bitcoin out of 21 million will be mined somewhere in the middle of next century. So really? by the time we, yeah, by the okay. time we get there, the transaction fees should in theory cover um, uh, the-, the be or, Whoever mines that last but, one is gonna be doing all right. Right, but at the same time, if let, let's say uh, out of, 10,000 uh, computers or 10,000 uh, uh, entities that run those 10,000 nodes, right? Let's say 5,000 decides, well, not, not, not enough money in that for us. We're going to leave that business. But that basically means that the remaining 5,000 nodes will share the whole uh, amount of the fees that being collected, right? Yeah. Um, sorry about that. Right. Um, so... It, it has this self-healing mechanism, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't think you're making enough money, you can kind of stop participating. But the, and now all then this the pie, all this pie will be divided between, you know. So you hope, you hope others will drop out, but uh, you need to sort of stay strong. Um, yeah. No, that's, that's yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, touching on on cryptocurrency, then. So for you know the, the you you know the normal person who's kind of investing out there and whatnot, do you think people should be getting involved in in cryptocurrency? Is that and, and, I, and I guess so. yeah, and, and I, I guess what 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 are the sort of potential issues with with crypto? Like, what what should the normal person kind of be looking out for when investing in crypto? Do you think? Because there's so many different cryptocurrencies, they all do different things, or they all work different ways. What 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 sort of differences have you seen, and what should people kind of be looking out for? Do you think? I I think ultimately people need to uh, continue their education, and they need to study. They need to do a deep dive. And maybe start with the Bitcoin because it's just a uh, you know sixty thousand pound gorilla, if you will, right? <laughs> and it will give them the the foundation, the basis, and then they can look at new projects and learn about the projects and understand what the projects are trying to do, and yeah, invest if they want to invest. Uh, I would also encourage people to participate and volunteer and you know work with different teams and see if they kind of like the concept, see what people are doing, different projects and. And th- that's the best way to learn, actually, to dive in. Well, what, are, what, what are the major differences in the projects? I've seen some that have been more eco-friendly and whatnot and, and stuff like that. But is there, is there a huge amount of difference in terms of ways that these different cryptos are being mined or, or whatnot? Or? I mean, there are obviously there is a proof of work, which is what Bitcoin is using, where the miners are actually mining the Bitcoin. And effectively, they're all competing for the next block, right? There's also proof of stake where instead of competing, there is a kind of round robin where every node generates next block in, in the- Oh, really? In, 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 so yeah. big, Bitcoin's kind of like a gold rush type thing, is it? Or Yeah, and, and that's why there is a kind of continuous arm ra- arms race where you have to buy better and faster computer. That, uh, power, use... power processing that, that gives you- the Yeah, 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 yeah. So could, yeah. Could, you, could you theoretically win every Bitcoin or is it like- Will it will sort of get spaced out amongst all of the miners in a way? No, in theory, if you have like a supercomputer that is, but it, so still the process is random, meaning that you, when you are trying to generate next, next hash and there is a certain kind of sequence. So for instance, you have to generate that hash and the first five digit, the first four digits have to be all zeros as an example, right? So what you do, you take that block and you keep adding kind of random character at the end and you're generating the next hash right. to see if that... So, I mean, I can be lucky and I can just have a laptop and I can come up with the next hash 
you know, once. So even if you have this supercomputer and there's 10,000 10, other people with the slower computers, potentially they can so that's what collectively. It's doing. So that's, what, that's what it's doing. And it's just putting in loads and loads of different numbers, trying to hit a magic number, basically. And the quicker and better yeah. processing your computer has, the more numbers it can input and try out. Yeah, once. yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, probability is on your side, right? Yeah. And out of, yeah. Oh, interesting. Um, okay, no, that sounds that sounds great. Um, I mean, we've uh, yeah. So I mean, there's there's so many out there. So I don't think we we need to necessarily talk about them all sort of individually and whatnot. But it sounds like uh, and it sounds like especially I think blockchain is going to be used more and more. I mean, is there any reason? I mean, is there any reason companies aren't so kind of like investing or doing that now, or are they? Where are we sort of at with the progression of blockchain? I mean, each company, they have their own strategies. If the company is successful as it is right now, they may be not so keen on jumping into blockchain, right? I mean, if you look look at MicroStrategy as an example, right, was Michael Saylor. Um, the company was doing great. It, it wasn't growing, but they, they had about 500 million in revenue every year and 20, 30 million in profit. So it was pretty stable business. And the guy decided to, so he basically, I'm, I'm paraphrasing what he said in one of the interviews, but he said they were looking for ways to um, uh, invest the, the 500 million that they had on the balance sheet. And with all the money printing, they were not comfortable buying US treasuries that were giving you 0.1% yield or you know 0.9% yield if you buy short-term treasuries. treasuries. So he wasn't interested in buying real estate. He wasn't interested in buying uh, stocks because, again, you have to make decisions and you have to investigate uh, what kind of stocks to buy. So Bitcoin to him was a natural, you know, natural option. And all of a sudden, uh, MicroStrategy stock went from, I, I don't remember the price, but like from $60 to 200 300 500 I don't remember what the price is. But basically, effectively, MicroStrategy now is really a Bitcoin fund yeah, with a little business, yeah, a little, yeah. <laughs> you know, an enterprise business on the side. So it worked for him or worked for MicroStrategies and for their investors. Um, but companies now, I mean, my, if somebody would ask me, I would tell them, look for real, look for real uh, application. Don't just say, okay, we're going to jump into blockchain. If it makes sense, do it. If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. I mean, if you're running a chain of, you know, Subway sandwiches, you know, sandwich shops, then I don't think you need blockchain. <laughs> yeah. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Uh, yeah, if you're if you're sharing the subway secrets, then you might you might need yeah. some protection on that. But um, no, that's great. And um, well, I finally just wanted to finish up on um, I guess more on, on to do with you know title finance and, and building a team there and whatnot. So um, uh, there's a lot of people who watch um, or listen to the podcast who are you know whether they've been in engineering and moving into to you know more managerial type roles or or they're looking to to set up their own fintech or startup. What well, what sort of advice would you give people? I guess making the transition into into starting a startup generally and, and building teams and whatnot? Is there any like lessons learned? Well, learned? yeah, I mean, in terms of building teams and starting a startup, there are a lot of tools these days that uh, make that process a lot easier. There, there are tools, there are websites where you can find uh, good engineers uh, offshore. Um, but I think in my experience, especially working with uh, remote developers or remote teams, communication is paramount. Right? Mm -hmm. You need to make sure that um, everybody know what they're doing. You need to make sure that you there, there's documentation. Um, it's very easy to kind of sit next to a developer and look at the same screen and kind of point fingers and say, what about this? What about that? How does that work? But when you work with people remotely and they're in a different time zone and by the time you wake up, they already spend five, mm -hmm. six hours doing something, right? And they made maybe a couple of hundred micro decisions in that process. If they don't have the good picture, if they don't understand what you guys are doing, it can spell trouble. So communication is very important. Having kind of documentation, um, sharing big picture is important in my mind. A lot of managers, they kind of like to micromanage and say, well, you have to do this and without explaining why it's done that way. And, and then you're basically not giving people the tools that they need to, like I said, make these micro decisions that uh, they need to make every day. So, yeah, I mean, you've obviously worked in, in localized teams as well as in outsourced teams. Sure. Do, do, you, do you see 
Um, has it worked really effectively for you, do you think? Or, or do you think having a localized team? Uh, I, I, I see benefits in well both. And, and yeah, yeah. So, and there's, there's a lot you need to consider, right? You know, consider when you're yeah. at the CTO level yeah. in terms of cost and resources. Sure. I, I, so. Correct. But at the same, I got to say that even localized teams, it would never be the same. After the COVID, yeah, uh, where true. everybody basically <laughs> worked remote, even if you have an office, People don't if, want to if be you want a good technical team, Yeah, if you want a good technical team these days, you have to offer the remote working, I think. That's what we found yeah. out a lot. So, yeah. Um, and if, yeah, if, 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 you know, COVID has done anything, it's, it's taught us how to adapt and, you know, how to utilize technology and communication and tools and, and work together in this kind of remote setting. So it's actually, it's probably really helped. You know, we, I had, a, I've talked, had a podcast recently where we, we talked about how crisis really actually it sort sure. of jump starts innovation and whether that be sure. the recession or, or COVID for the med tech industry, for instance, but it is, it has, you know, it's, it's really shifted. I think a lot of, um, a lot of how we sort of manage and, and, and do our day to day. Um, I'm sure that's really yeah. benefited you guys for sure. Um, so where, right. where, where, where are you sort of going from here with, 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 with Tidal and for instance, are you, are you investing a lot more into the product or is it a case of where, where are you sort of going from? From the current point. So, right, our, our focus right now is on going live. Uh, as I said, we're on testnet and we will go live in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have our initial set of uh, project partners uh, protocols lined up. So, we will start uh, doing that and then we'll iterate. I mean, as you, I'm sure you, you know, um, um, Reed Hoffman, the, the guy who uh, found uh, LinkedIn said, if you're not embarrassed of your first release at some point in the future, you're released too late. So I, I'm trying to be not as it's embarrassed. What the first LinkedIn probably... looked like, yeah. But, uh... Right. So so the first version is the first version. We'll, we'll go live soon, but I'm sure, I mean, there are a few things I know we want to do, but I'm sure there'll be other items that will come up, other ideas that will come up as we have more feedback from our clients, from you know the protocols that we insure and people that buy insurance on on title yeah and so, so it's right and and i guess for people who are watching who maybe are interested in this and want to get involved how can sort of users and customers get involved with that then so we have a pretty active community on uh, on telegram you guys can you know go and search for title finance and you can find a telegram channel uh, obviously we have a test net so people can go to title.finance mm -hmm and uh, register with uh, uh, Testnet and try to buy uh, insurance with Play Money there. Yeah. So, so those are yeah my, first, my first entry into the world of, uh, of, of, of decentralized finance. It's not something I've ever right. explored too much of. But um, no, that's great. And we'll, we'll, we'll definitely put links at the, at the bottom of the podcast as well, um, for sure. But um, no, it's, it's, been, it's been great having you on, Dan. Um, I think I've learned a lot personally. I'm, I'm, I hope a lot of users have been able to get get something out of uh, or listeners not users but getting out of something today is there anything else you you wanted to, to finish on um anything else where they, people can find you or i said title.finance is the best place to go is it yeah i'm uh, yeah i'm also on, on on twitter and uh i we also have a discord channel and uh we answer questions there oh nice do you do yeah. like live, live q a's and whatnot or yeah we, yeah we do that as well so yeah i'm uh, i'm on basically on every media linkedin uh telegram guys can find me if they want to find me and, and now the hunter bomb podcast so um well no thank you thank yeah. you so much <laughs> thank you so much for coming on dan and uh, i'll speak to you soon thank you very much matt it was a pleasure speaking to you